the point of this is to provide the best facts driven show that we possibly can ideally you have a glue guy who is good hashtag glue guy hashtag locker room guy you can't go sign bobby holy to a trillion dollars you can't do these things very satisfying the absolute best nyr show in town this is the liberty blue liberty blue Rangers Podcast. Rangers Podcast. With Andrew Chelby. Andrew Chelby. And Nick Zoraris. Nick Zoraris. Rangers fans, welcome to episode eight of Liberty Blue. This is the best Rangers podcast in town. I am Andrew Chelney alongside Nick Zararis. We are Liberty Blue. We scream about the Rangers so that you can save your voice. That's how deeply we care about you. We appreciate that you've joined us for the ride. This is, of course, episode eight. We are live on Twitch, YouTube, and on Twitter. I mean, where are we live right now? We are branching out we were just on twitch and now we are pretty much everywhere that you can be live on and the uh we will put the full video up on our youtube at liberty blue podcast and the audio version will be up wherever you get your podcast whether it be apple spotify google play wherever else if it's not on your favorite uh listening pro platform let us know and we'll put it on there as well at Liberty Blue Pod on Twitter and Instagram. I am at Chelmy Andrew C H E L N E Y Andrew on Twitter, and Nick Zararis is at Nick Z A R A R I S on there as well. Nick, we are live on more than one platform. Look at that. We're we're out here being media moguls today. Yeah, technology is cool sometimes. When it wants to work, technology is very helpful. I, I'm one of those people who is skeptical of technology. Like, I'm very much one of those hang on. I hang on three way intersection, three way intersection, <laughs> three way intersection. Okay, yes. I'm very much one of those people who took the Twilight Zone to heart as a kid. We're like, I'm just skeptical of everything and everyone. So you tell me I can stream on like five things at once. I'm like, this is going to fry my computer. It's not going to work. It's going to require me to log in on all five of these things at once. Somehow it's working. So I'm going to knock on my desk right now for good luck that it's going to keep working. And we'll talk a little bit of hockey and have a good show. Absolutely. So one of the things before I, I put this in the rundown that we really should highlight here is, is our buddy, our good friend, our, our former head coach, the New York Rangers, David Quinn, has a, has a new job. And yeah, I feel like the entirety of replies and the quote tweets from the sharks voicing it were uh not very flattering of of the former's of the former rangers head coach do you agree or disagree that that david quinn could be better in san jose than he could than he was in new york Sure. I mean, that's kind of the idea of hiring a retread coach is that a change of scenery will allow them to learn from their mistakes. I, we see this a lot more in other sports where guys who get a second or third chance usually do better because they take their time away from the game as an opportunity to learn something new, to reflect on what they made, what mistakes they've made, to try and maybe learn something new schematically. That's especially a thing in football where somebody will lose their job and then they'll spend that year they're away from the sport, visiting other coaches, visiting schools at the college level, just trying to digest a little bit more to think about it without the the grind of their day-to-day -day coaching because coaching is a miserable job. You're supposed to be the first one at the, at practice at six, 7 AM you're sitting there. A lot of your preparation is done before you have players around. Then you have to coach with the players. Then you have to sit and digest over what they did during practice, then apply that to a game and then repeat the process a couple hundred times over the course of a season. So in a vacuum, this should make sense. David Quinn should be better. And I'm using air quotes for that, but Based on how he's handled his year away from hockey, I'm skeptical because he, every time I hear him talk about his time in New York, he puts the blame on somebody else. I know there's that clip floating around that I, I think hockey stat miner originally posted from the Cam Jansen and that uh, one blues reporter had David Quinn on during the course of the during the course of the last season. And Quinn was talking about, well, you know, when we were there in that game against Washington and, you know, we had a third line that would have been pretty good at BU of Hedo, Kako and Lafreniere. We, we weren't ready for that type of situation. And a couple months later, that was the most consistent line the Rangers had in the playoffs, that kind of tone deafness of Quinn always, even when he was the coach of the Rangers was never like, 
yeah, the team is struggling. I need to do better. It was always, we need to find somebody who can be the new Jesper Faust. It was never, I need to help somebody be the new Jesper Faust. It was, maybe Kako could do that. Maybe someone we brought in here could do that. And that always has rubbed me the wrong way about David Quinn. It's why after that first, even like halfway into that first season, you usually give a new coach a grace period to kind of maybe, okay, he's got to figure it out a little bit, especially his first time coaching at the NHL level. But like, dude, you, for three straight years, you did the same exact song and dance and the team didn't really improve. I mean, they gave him a significantly better roster. The second year he was in charge, they brought in Truba, they brought in Panarin. The results weren't that much different. I mean, the Rangers were, I think, six points out of the last playoff spot when the league got paused, maybe four points when the league got paused in March of what 2020. And they got in the bubble. They got embarrassed in the bubble. And I, I understand why David Quinn is – he's sellable. You can tell your fan base. You can tell your sponsors, your advertisers, the people in your office, front office – this is a guy who's learned is what you're going to pitch. He's recruited elite talent at the college level. He didn't win anything at the college level with that talent. That is something we need to, that a lot of people kind of overlooked that this is a guy who had Clayton Keller, who had Jack Eichel, who had Charlie McAvoy, who didn't win a, a thing at the college level, which is, you know, when you have that kind of talent on your team at that level, you should be winning a national championship. But it should be different, but based on how he's carried himself in the last year, I do not think it will be. The one thing that really kind of strikes out to me about David Quinn's time in New York was the, at least from, from an outsider's perspective, is I, I feel like he had this thought process that he was going to jump from a college perspective where he's doing a lot of coaching and a lot of, I don't want to say babying, but a lot of kind of having the, the kid grow up before his eyes approach where he was going to step in the NHL and not have to do that. That's kind of the sense that I get, especially after listening to that clip from, from Cam's pot from Cam Jensen's podcast was that like, he had this notion that, okay, now I'm in the NHL. I don't have to do any of that anymore, but he stepped into a rebuilding process where a lot of the players that were on the team were about the same age as the kids that he worked, that he was coaching at BU. So, he kind of had this, uh, it, to, to me, it kind of just feels like he thought he was stepping into a, a, a role with a roster that knew what they were going to do and they were going to compete and they were going to be all this and that. But a lot of the roster was like, they could have played at BU. Like this is a lot of the kids with the same age or younger or around that same age. So like, I, I don't maybe like the way he approached that. Maybe in San Jose, he's learned that, hey, maybe maybe don't do that. Maybe don't have this thought process of, Hey, you know, this, like, you don't have to coach these kids. Like the kids will bring them, bring themselves up by their bootstraps, you know, quote unquote, uh, may, maybe in San Jose, he's learned don't do that and actually be a head coach. We'll see. Cause my career isn't a BU guy. David Quinn is a BU guy. They're both BU guys. So there's the connection there. They clearly have a lot of trust in each other. So we'll, we'll see how that plays out, but it's, Kind of interesting to me how he was slotted into a rebuilding position with the Rangers, and that didn't really go anywhere. And now he's going to San Jose, a team that is probably going to rebuild here sooner rather than later. You still have Lassick and Carlson and all these contracts and, and older guys on the team. But I, judging by the way that they've been making their roster now over the past couple of seasons, it doesn't look like they're going to be cup contenders anytime soon. So San Jose is another rebuilding situation. I, I don't know if David Quinn will change his approach, but I hope he does. So a couple things in there. Number one, I want to, the one defense I've heard of David Quinn's time in New York, especially the 56 game season, the year he ended up getting fired is they brought in Truba, Fox, Panarin, and that kind of rejigged the time frame for the front office's opinion. It, 
If you believe the Rangers at face value, what they said about why they fired Quinn, Jeff Gordon, and John Davidson, they felt the team that year should have been better and probably should have made the playoffs in the shortened 56 game season. That is, that is the story that is on the record. That is going to be the, in the history book. If the Rangers ever do end up winning anything, that's the narrative that is out there. And I understand that if that is tr- if that's true, if we're going to accept that as being true, that means David Quinn's short-minded decisions, burying those kids lower in the lineup, playing Kako on the fourth line, you know, the clip that spawned the Larry David thing on the Michael K show, everybody remembers that. Those types of things are a little bit, those decisions in the lineup, playing guys like Colin Blackwell in the top six as opposed to Kako, those type of decisions are justifiable if David Quinn is going into his meetings with the higher ups in the organization and they're saying, David, we expect to make the playoffs this year. We think we have a group that's capable of it. You're going to need to run a shorter bench. You can't have the kids making mistakes. If that requires you to run, you know, the kids out there only nine, 10 minutes a night, we think we can sneak in the playoffs and we have a goalie where we feel like if we get in the playoffs, and he gets hot at the right time, we think we could really make some noise here, even though we might be a little bit ahead of schedule. If you want to tell me that, I could believe that as the narrative as to why David Quinn is kind of bitter about what happened to him in New York. But again, I don't know how much I believe that official narrative because of the people who are pushing it. In particular, when the insiders are pushing a narrative, that usually means it's to benefit somebody's agenda as opposed to an accurate recollection of what happened. That's like the old saying, there's three sto- There's three sides to every story, your truth, their truth, and what actually happened, that type of thing. That's kind of what I think the David Quinn period in New York is always going to be, because we're never going to really know if that's why they fired the, uh, uh, David Quinn, John Davidson, and Jeff Gordon. I mean, yes, but also no, because like I, I – can see where that thought process is coming from, but what I don't agree with it, for, from that perspective is David Quinn's kind of responses to, to a lot of the things that were happening after the fact. He's Because if he came out and was just like, you know, we as management decided this was the, this was how we were going to do things. We as a group decided we're, we're, this is how we're going to approach the lineup, all the, the time on ice the young kids have, you know, all these things. And as a as a group, we made these decisions and it didn't work out. If he said that, I would believe that. But that's okay. not what he said. A lot of the things that he said was, "Oh, woe was me." You know, everything that I did was wrong, and and I'm you know I'm getting all this blame, but it's not my fault. Like that's kind of the vibe that I'm getting out of his responses, which is not helping me buy that 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 narrative. It's like if mm. if you really want us to believe that this was happening well then at least make some kind of a push to to get that out there because right now from all the things that he said during his tenure as a rangers head coach and afterwards that's not the vibe that i'm getting okay so let me say something to that that is also part of playing the game as somebody who wants to stay in the loop if you want to stay on the coaching carousel the gm carousel forever Occasionally, you're going to have to bite your tongue. You're going to have to find a way to not blame your boss because no GM wants a head coach who puts the blame on him. So if you're going to push, that would be my counterpoint to that. Again, I'm not I'm not here to defend David Quinn. I didn't agree with how he managed the bench. He's not. And th- this is something we've talked about in regards to Gallant as well. Not a good communicator. It, it, no. Being a head coach, you have to be able to convey your thoughts. I don't necessarily need to agree with all of your decisions, but you need to be able to articulate them in a way to justify them. That's all I'm saying. I'm not, I'm never going to agree with anybody a hundred percent on anything, anything. It's just, sure. it's not feasible, but sure. you need to be able to articulate a position in a way that even if I don't agree, I can respect how you came to that conclusion. And David Quinn never really did that. It, it was a lot of, well, we need to find a way to play a little more gritty, a little more straight line. We need our guys to stop overpassing. Well, David, you're the head coach. I don't know why you're yeah. telling me this. <laughs> I, I, I'm watching I'm watching your interview on MSG Network. The game just ended. You can go in the locker room and tell Artemi Panarin to stop sure. forcing the cross seam pass if it's not there. I don't know what you want me to do. It's like when the politicians tweet about yeah. an ongoing crisis. I'm not the president. I'm not in the <laughs> Senate. 
You're you yeah. can do something about this. I cannot, David. I'm sorry. Yeah. I know Mika Zabinajad is frustrating you, but I don't have his phone number. Maybe you do. <laughs> yeah, I I agree with you. Uh, it's you you want your team to play the way that you want them to play, and yet, like, also again, like half the team were rookies or in their second year. Like, you can't expect Capo Caco at 18, 19 years old to just come into the NHL and be like, all right, well, I will play your, ha you know, your hashtag gritty. Again, no one knows what the word grit means in the NHL. Everybody has a different definition to what hashtag grit, hashtag locker room guy, hashtag team player means. Everybody kind of assumes one thing, but it could mean a, a totally different thing depending on who you ask. Nobody really knows what that means. But like, you can't expect rookies and second-year players who you had a lot of on the roster to come in and be like, okay, we're gonna play this very specific style of hockey. You know, immediately we're gonna we're gonna know what to do and and how to do it and and all these things. Where you have to do the coaching, and if you're gonna coach the media, then you're not you, you're not coaching the team. You have to tell the team what you what you want to do. You can't just you know you can't go up to Larry Brooks and be like, oh yeah, you know. We, we have to play grittier. Okay, how about you go in the back and you tell Zabinajad and Kreider how to do that as opposed to saying the same four nonsense words game in and game out and expecting different results. That's not that's not how you head coach, especially in the NHL, man. This is the NHL. It's not beer league. All right, so let's get into the nuts and bolts now. So the big thing right now is we're all looking at smoke signals coming from Long Island to determine if Nazem Kadri is an Islander or not. There is no record. There is no documentation. Um, the insiders are all doing the same thing we're doing. They're all saying because it's quiet, that likely means he's got some kind of agreement with the Islanders. The Islanders probably need to clear a little bit of salary to make a Kadri contract happen. They'd need to clear it. I think when I was looking before, they have about $5 million in space, so they probably need to clear about another 2 $3 million to keep Kadri in the mix. From what I understand, from what a lot of people are speculating, because nobody knows, they're looking at something in the neighborhood of three years between seven and eight million dollars. That's kind of the numbers I've been seeing and reading from the people who are all guessing like the rest of us. This is one of those times where we can't really know because nobody knows. So it's an interesting idea. I mean, we talked about it last week, what Kadri does to the Islanders. I mean, they definitely need another impact forward. And he is that kind of nasty veteran forward who's going to be able to get under the skin of the other team, to create offense at a high level coming off a career year. By all means, I mean, I get it why you would do that if you're the Islanders. You didn't get Johnny Gaudreau, so you need to supplant your forward group with somebody capable of scoring 30 goals because that's the Islanders' issue the last couple of years is they haven't had enough offense. Uh, it's fine for them. Uh, it's frustrating that we don't know for sure or not, but it, it's a fine transaction. I see the logic in it. Kadri makes your team better. It's, it's not, yeah. you know, I'm not here to suggest it as a Kadri doesn't make a team better. He's there. He's a great top six player. He's going to make any team better. But the, the question that you have to ask for a couple of questions here is one, when is this loose stick going to stop being funny to the, to the insiders? Like, I know that I know the insiders sometimes love to play nice and, and not, not dig deeper. We really should be digging deeper. But this is a, just egregious to a certain extent. Like, Lou Lamorello is one of is one of 32 coach uh, GMs in the NHL. Just because he doesn't tell you anything doesn't mean one that you should find it funny and two not, not be digging around more so with other teams to find out the information because it's your job to do that. So with with Lou like uh, okay, he doesn't want leaks, he doesn't want people to know insider is, is to know so let's 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 find out. Let's what what are you you doing specifically, uh, you know, insert blue check mark here, that is going to get you the information that you need to know about the Islanders that Lou doesn't want you to know. Like, with, with Nazem Kadri, yeah, he's going to be a great player, and if the Islanders get him, he's going to be fine. But is he, is he really, like, if you just get Nazem Kadri and nobody else, are the Islanders uh, a solidified playoff team? The answer is, I don't know. They have a very good goalie. They still have Matt Barzell and, you know, and yeah, I mean, listen, uh, Ilyas Rook is a phenomenal goaltender. Like, you know, make no mistake about it. And you, and you, you 
also have Semyon Varlamov in there as well. There were rumors that maybe Varlamov could be dealt uh, because a lot of teams were looking for goaltending. Maybe maybe he still could get dealt. We don't know yet. But as of right now, it's Varlamov and, and Sorokin in that. So with that with that, that duo pairing, they're, they're still a very formidable team. And despite them not making the playoffs, I wouldn't write them out necessarily for you know not not making it again this next season. But I like there still has to be other moves that really support the the idea that the Islanders are going to be a, a solid playoff team. Nazem Kadri does move the needle for me, but they need more pieces to really make me feel like they're a dangerous team. Um, agreed, definitely. Um, they still need to sign Romanov, who they traded for, but he still doesn't have a contract. Um, they're going from Roman Chara on the second pair with Noah Dobson to Romanov should be a solid improvement in their defense. They are going to continue to try and win all of these games in a grinded out style. When you have as good, a, I I like the Islanders' defensive group. I mean, Pelik, Pulak. You add Romanov, who has potential. Dobson really kind of had a really good his really establishing season last year. So defensively, I think they'll be in okay shape. The forward group, like we just said, that's the question mark. I mean, they still don't know if they're going to keep Anthony Bovillier because he's a restricted free agent. He might be somebody that's jettisoned in hopes of bringing Kadri in. Brock Nelson's coming off a career year, but Nick Palmieri, not really at this point in the career. You know, he's a supplemental player. He's not somebody who's going to be able to carry a line, drive a line at this point in his career, but they'll be okay. The Met, We talked about this a few weeks ago because we were talking about the Metro at a macro level where we went through all eight teams. I like what the most of the teams in the Metro have done, but I'm not particularly worried about the Islanders. I, I mean, they have talent, and if they continue to play that Barry Trot style under uh, Lane Lambert, sure, I could be concerned about what happens. But until I see what they look like under a new coach, I mean, that's also something we've got to consider here. Even if they do end up running a variation on what Barry Trotz likes to do, new coach takes a while to stink it, sick in. I mean, it took Gerard Gallant quite a while to get the Rangers playing the way he wanted them to last year. Uh, that's that's part of a new coach's process. They need the repetitions with their group in practice and in game to kind of figure out where they are. So Kadri, sure, uh, that makes the Islanders better. That uh, I would rather Nazem Kadri not be an Islander, but, you know, that that's the way hockey works, unfortunately. Yeah, sure. Uh, Nazem is going to be a great Islander if he signs there, which, of course, again, <laughs> nobody knows because Lou doesn't say anything, and the insiders don't poke around more than they feel like they should, for better or for worse. So we have no idea. The idea that Kadri will be an Islander because there's silence around him makes sense that he'd be an Islander just because that's Lou's way. And I, what I don't understand is if that's already done, then why doesn't Lou just sign the man? But like, I, I, I know you have to make trades. Okay, I can tell you why. There's yeah, that situation why. to make that happen. Yeah. But like, they have to make trades to make that happen. I, I understand that. But like, is it is it that hard to make moves when when you know you have you have players that like I I it's it's Andrew, it, it it's hard to, to like, move I, salary. Uh, yeah. Didn't you hear Chuck it, Fletcher? It's so hard. It is hard. Oh, it's so hard. Cry me a river, man. Like it's like the just dude, just like, like the Islanders moved two second round picks to to get Devon. Like, they they got two second round picks just to get Devon Taves out of here. And Devon Taves is and what he does. And that in Colorado, he was amazing. He was one of the, the backstops to the Avalanche winning the cup. Like, if you want to make it happen, you will find a way to happen. And I like it, you need more than one team to, to get a trade done. I understand that. But you have cap that you need to move in order to sign somebody because if you don't do it quickly, Nazem Kadri will turn around and say, okay, I'll just go somewhere else. Like, you have to move quickly with these things. It, it's very important that you show the free agent, like, hey, we are doing everything in our power to make space for you so that you can wear our jersey. And right now, it's August 1st. Where is Nazem Kadri going? Supposedly the Islanders, but right now, nobody really knows. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the other thing that's out there is Patrick Kane. Uh, 
Jonathan Taze did a sit down with the athletic a couple of weeks ago, where he kind of talked about how he felt about the direction of the team. And most people are operating under the assumption that Patrick Kane wants to go somebody where else to have an opportunity to try and win one more Stanley cup before he retires. He's a free agent after the upcoming season, he's owed 10 and a half million dollars, which is a massive cap hit and likely why that will be an in season move. But the one team I did see linked to him, by more than one person, and this was eventually shot down by somebody from the Chicago. I think it was Mark Lazarus who shot it down that the Stars had been linked to Patrick Kane because the Stars were looking for another top six forward. Because um, why can't I think of his name? Oh, Radulov went back to Russia, so they need a replacement forward to go somewhere in their lineup. Um, it's interesting. I mean, the Stars' problem last year was offense. Um, under their old head coach, whose name is escaping me at the moment because Rick I had too many things. Yes, on, under Rick, Rick Bonus, bonus. Defense, yeah. first, defense first group, not a lot of offense. Most of their offense came from the Joe Pavelski, uh, Jason Robertson, and Rupe Hintz group. Other than that, I mean, at this point, Tyler Sagan is playing with a hip held together with scotch tape and glue, which is less than ideal. And Jamie Benn just isn't the same player he was when he won the Hart Trophy all those years ago. So they need a top six forward. Patrick Kane is still an effective player. I, I only really bring this up so we can talk about it in the context of Larry's going to have to find something else because he loves him some Patrick Kane. He's, he's written about one thing a week the last couple <laughs> weeks in this this part of the offseason. And this is like his Josh Anderson yeah. crush. Like yep. when he's got his heart set on a player, he, he really wants him some Patrick Kane. And we talked about this a few weeks ago, just purely for the off the ice stuff. I'm out on Patrick Kane. And even aside from that, the Rangers can't make the math work till in season because they can't take 10 and a half. They couldn't even take five and a half if Chicago retained half of his contract right now. So that would have to be an in season move. And if Kane gets dealt before the season, he's not going to be a Ranger and Larry's going to have to find someone else. <laughs> it's interesting because I, I, while the Dallas rumor did allegedly get shut down, one of the things that sticks out to me is that the Athletic put out an article recently. Uh, kind of labeling the, the worst contracts in the NHL. Yes. And Tyler Sagan is at the very top of that list. He's making a boatload of money for, I think, three more seasons or, or even longer than that. And Thanks my guy, as you said, is battling so many injury problems. I, I mean, you, f you feel for him, right? Because he's, he's not, it's not like he's 44 and hanging on by a thread. Like, my guy, you know, he's, he's not that old. I think he's like 29 or 30. Like, he's not he's not you know incredibly incredibly old so like the uh if, if he has a healthy off season and he finally gets to kind of heal all of the ailments that were bothering him for for all these years then maybe he could return to at least somewhat that form that we had before especially in boston the one thought process that i have in, in terms of dallas chicago maybe they just do a one for one like hey like if you if you trade us Tyler Sagan, we'll give you Taves or Kane or whoever. I mean, I'll, I'll use something to make the math work because Sagan's contract is longer than those two. I'm not I'm not the GM of either of these teams, so I'm sure if they want to do that, they could figure out a way. But I'm just spitballing here. I'm sure that the starting point was Tyler Sagan plus maybe a boatload of picks and prospects to make that happen because Tyler Sagan right now obviously is not as good as Patrick Kane or Jonathan Taves. Um, that's an NBA trade. The, what you just described is the type of thing that happens in the NBA where a team looking to clear your cap trades a guy with multiple years left on their deal. I don't know if NHL GMs are just smart enough to do that, to be honest with you. Like <laughs> that mean, makes I'm a lot of I'm sense. I'm sure they are, but you know, that makes it, sense. It, it, like in a vacuum, it makes sense. Because Chicago, even in a lean period, is going to need people to put on, you know, the banners sure. on the season ticket holder stuff to entice people like, you want to be a part of this. We're not very good right now, but we've got Seth Jones. We've got Tyler Sagan, who's still – Tyler Sagan is not a bad hockey player. He was, I think no. – I think, I think he was 0. 0.7, 0. 0.8 points per game last year, something like that. But again, this is somebody coming off of major, major injury. I mean, the year they went to the cup final against the Lightning, his I, the, the joint where his leg connects to his pelvis was basically hanging on by a thread, and he gutted through those entire playoffs on basically one leg. And Not smart, really by the way. Don't, maybe don't do that. Yeah. Don't, don't do that. That's, yeah. I'm not a doctor. Don't do that. You know? Uh, 
Dude, I'm not here to tell you what to do. Maybe don't do that. Hey, man, if, if we were streaming on Facebook, people would have closed out of this because on yeah. Facebook, they talk about that's how much it means to win the Stanley Cup. <laughs> I, listen, it's, it's, you're at that point, you're hurting yourself. You're also yes. hurting your team. And you're hurting your team. You can't, you can't move. Like, yeah. I, listen, I, I appreciate the, the, the want to play. When you're that injured, especially the cup final, you don't get a chance to play in a lot of these. And when you can, you want to help the team as much as possible. I understand all of that. When you can't even walk or can barely skate because you're because of, of an injury that is so major that you, like you physically cannot help your team in any way, way, shape, or form, get off the ice. Get off the ice. Help your help yourself first. If you're like 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 we talked about, like if your hip is that broken and that shattered into a million pieces what is you playing out there gonna help the team at all you can't you can't skate you're very timid with the puck you can't throw your body around like you're not getting into the dirty area so yeah of course if people watch you play they're gonna be like oh why is Tyler, you know why is Tyler Sagan not doing anything in the playoffs yeah because he's so hurt he can't move and yet because of the idea that oh he's this tough guy guy and tough guys play in the playoffs like he has to go out there but he's not helping himself and not helping the team yeah all right let's get to the blood and guts of today's episode where we're going to talk about roster construction and how teams get put together so i like last week and i trust me i'm building up to something where we're going to put together all of these all of these ideas into one big thing so last week we talked about how much you're allocating by position group between forward defense goalie this week, we're talking about where you get your players, whether it be trades, free agency, or the draft. And this is one of those things where I know you're thinking, why is Nick thinking about this in the middle of August when there are so many other things going on? I'm constantly looking for answers to questions that nobody's really asking. It's one of my one of my special skills is I'm constantly thinking, what's the inefficiency? What is my favorite team not doing that they could be doing that doesn't require anything else? And one of the things that I talked about last week was you don't want to pay too much for defense because offense is always going to be more valuable. And if you can help it, you're probably better off with two medium priced goalies than one super expensive one. This week, it's a little bit more, I'd say, nuanced in talking about where you get players because not all trades are the same, not all draft picks are the same, not all free agent signings are the same. But generally speaking, the way teams are constructed is not what you think. Most people assume that you extract most of your value from your draft picks because those are going to be the cheapest players because they're on entry level and restricted free agent contracts and that players you acquire in free agency and trades are going to be more expensive because they are going to be for unrestricted free agent or later restricted free agent years. So that's our kind of baseline understanding. So I'm going to switch over to my spreadsheet here so I can read. So of the 32 teams in the NHL, on average, they pay 36% of your roster is from players you've drafted, 28% is from players you've traded for, and about 34% is from players from free agency. Now, it's important to think about it in the terms of not every free agent is the same. Um, there's a big difference between signing an Artemi Panarin at the top of free agency and signing a Ryan Carpenter three days into free agency. Those are not the same type of thing, and you're not going to pay the same type of money for them, obviously. But when you think about free agency trades and the draft, the draft is where you need to get your high-end guys. When you think about the teams that win the Stanley Cup, it is teams that are centered around two or three marquee guys that they drafted, they got for under year, and it is difficult for teams that don't have that high-end talent that they drafted to be to be good just to be frank to be as high-end as possible so when you think about it you think about it in context of the rangers and i wrote it down here the rangers are nine players they drafted nine players they traded for five free agents so you think about the drafted players the one drafted player they have who is maximum value that is giving them as much as they possibly can get is the guy they drafted 10 years ago, Chris Kreider. That is the one draft pick they have who's giving them really good value, especially considering what he's worth. I know a 50-plus goal season is a major statistical outlier, but in terms of just thinking for this exercise, Kreider is the one draft pick who's checking the box because you got to remember, 
Adam Fox wasn't a Rangers draft pick. They had to trade for him. Okay, Andre Miller very well could be in that group. You need to see him do it for longer than he did last year. First couple months, a little bit of trying to get his feet under him again, and then as the season went along, kept getting better. But for most teams in the NHL, you need those to be your key guys. And it's very interesting that this is the year the Rangers are really going to have to turn over a fair amount of responsibility to them because they have no other choice. Uh, just being frank with you, they do not have the money to go out and add um, a top six forward who's going to be able to make an impact. They just don't. Even at the trade deadline, they're going to have to wait to the deadline to have the three and a half, four million dollars necessary to go out and get somebody. So thinking on a macro level, there are a few interesting outliers that we could talk about too. Obviously, the expansion team, Seattle and Vegas, they're going to be in their own category. Just the way you assemble those rosters isn't comparable to everybody else. The ones that I really jumped out to me, one, the Oilers only have one player on their active roster right now that they traded for. The Panthers only have four players that they drafted because they traded a bunch and they lost a few in free agency. Winnipeg only has two traded for players. That speaks gives credence to the idea a lot of people have Winnipeg on their no trade list. And the one I want to focus on here before we talk about the Rangers specifically is Colorado, because Colorado made two really, really big trades. And those are the trades that put them over the top. They won the Stanley Cup last year because they got Devontae's, as you mentioned before, when we were talking about the Islanders for two second round picks. And Devontae's is one of probably the 10 best, 15 best defensemen in the entire sport, regardless of left versus right, where he plays in the lineup, because I know at points he was second pair for Colorado. And Nazem Kadri, who, if everybody remembers, they got for Tyson Berry, who Tyson Berry is a boutique player. He can run your power play. He's got to play third pair, though, because he's not good defensively. They got him for Nazem Kadri, and they got that pick that turned into Alex Newhook, which is also a useful player who's going to be important for them going forward, especially if they don't retain Nazem Kadri. So pick my brain, Andrew. What questions do you have in terms of where you're getting your players from? I think one of the biggest things to keep in mind when you build a team is how do I get the most complete team out there? I think taking a like focusing on one specific area of the three that you mentioned is the wrong way to go about it. I think yeah. whatever gets you to the best team possible is the route that you have to take for the situation that you're in. Uh, you see a lot of these, a lot of media broadcasts. They'll say, "Oh, you know, Team X, they're they they draft so, so well. Look at how many players are on are on this team that were drafted by the organization." I say to that, "Who cares?" I say to that, "Who cares?" Because it, while drafting is very important, I'm not saying it's not. It what matters at the end of the day is how good your roster is. So. While it's nice, I guess on you know on the broadcast to mention that I don't know, fifteen of the eighteen guys that are on your roster right now are homegrown talents. Does that in it innately make you a better team? And the answer to that is yes, and also no, because it, because you want the best team that you could possibly field at at one given opportunity. If you have the chance to trade two of your homegrown talents for one talent who is better than both of them, do it. <laughs> like it it for for some reason, at least in the NHL, GMs hate doing that or at least they're very reluctant to do that. They will hold on to their talents as much as possible for as long as possible and you know, sometimes even too long and I understand that you're a general manager, you need to hold on to them for as long as you feel like you should because they're your draft pick. You like you you want to see them succeed in the jer in, in the jersey of the team that you're working for. I understand that. But the one thing that people have to keep in mind here is that you can't play every single draft pick that you select. It's not possible. Sometimes you draft players to trade them because if you have like let's say you have 8 picks in the draft are you telling me that you think that you realistically see all eight of these players playing in your jersey? The answer to that is no. You're gonna have like these are assets essentially. Like it's it's you know these are these are human beings, right? That like they're talents. It's weird to think of them as assets, but essentially, like if you remove their name, they're just a like they're a draft pick, and you move draft picks all the time. 
but because there are names associated with these draft picks, all of a sudden you're very, very reluctant to to let them go. And I think that's one of the 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 not so great things about the NHL's I thought process with with trades. It's like it's like you if you if you draft twelve players in one draft, there's those not all twelve players are gonna, are gonna play for you. Like you're gonna have to move on from some of them in order to make your team better. So, like you you really need to kind of. I think adjust your thought process as to how you acquire talent. Your your draft picks, which is what Tampa Bay has done a really good job at, is they are filling their bottom six with homegrown talent because they're they're one they're good and they're cheaper. So you can have the Ross Coltons in there. You can have really good young players in the bottom six to kind of fill out the roster and have that be you know the bug and play guys that that make up your you make up your team but if you're expecting 17 out of the 18 guys to be homegrown i got bad news for you it's mo- it very rarely turns into success and you have to explore all three options in order to, to to find a team that makes you the best possible roster that you can possibly field at the end of the day it doesn't matter who this person got got drafted by. It doesn't matter. Does this player make your team better? Yes or no? And I feel like more GMs should have that thought process when constructing their roster. Okay, so actually we can talk about this because I have the data right in front of me. So the teams with the most players drafted making up their team are kind of who you would expect. The Kings, who are a team that is in the middle of a rebuild. That makes sense, a lot of them. Interestingly, the Flyers are also up there at 13 players as well. The Islanders have 12 players they drafted. The Devils have 11. Winnipeg has 10. The Oilers have 10. The Bruins have 10. And the Sabres have 10. What do all those teams have in common? They're not cup contenders. Uh, Just being frank with you. Boston is probably a playoff team if everyone's healthy. The Islanders might be a playoff team. I don't think the Flyers are a playoff team. The Kings, they were a playoff. The Flyers might be lucky to win 20 games this season, Like honestly. All right, that's ridiculous. They're going to win more than 20 games. (laughs) All right, fine. They'll win 25. All right, fine. You got me. They will hang around. They won't be good, but they will be in the hunt graphic. They will be like the third team in the in the hunt graphic during the national broadcast. Is, is Nick like, Delorier hey, going to score you fifty points and en route to a a, a, a play in spot? Like what? What is this? I mean, beside the point, but the Flyers, Flyers. I mean, they they might actually not win all. I mean, they won't win a lot of games for sure. Confirmed. You can you can get back to me in March about that, but. Flyers like legitimately might win 30 games, like actually. Okay. So uh, other than those teams, I mean, all of those teams, but like you said before, I, I think it's important not to get too hung up on where you get guys. I think the most important thing, and I emphasized this last week in terms of just pure cap space, you need to have flexibility. The benefit of having these younger guys, the guys you've drafted, or if you've traded for restricted free agents is That allows you to be more flexible in your roster construction. If you have a bunch of prospects, you can turn them into a shiny toy for your team. The kid, it's funny when you think about it because Vegas only has, I think, one player they drafted over the last four years who's played, who's supposed to be on their roster this upcoming season, not counting expansion draft guys, obviously, but they traded pretty much their only good NHL prospects for a season and a half of Max Pacioretty, who's in Carolina now, and um, Peyton Krebs. They traded uh, for literally nothing, by the way. Yeah. Literally nothing. Yeah. Just cap space. Literally cap nothing. space is valuable. And it's the most, yeah. it's, it's one of those, it's the point here that I'm making again. And I've made l- uh, last week and I'm going to make next week when we kind of tie everything all together, when we talk about it, where you combine, where you're getting your guys, how much they cost into more of a macro level, the state of the NHL type thing. Flexibility is the most important thing because you never know who could become available. Did the rest of the NHL know that Jonathan Huberto was going to be available last week when the Flames traded for him and Mackenzie Weger, who are both very good players? Probably not. There, there are not. Huberto didn't know either, which is yeah. Surpri- that that's it, also it, that's also a good point. That's kind of surprising to me. I think I said this last week that like I thought this trade went down because Huberto went to Florida and said, "I don't want to be here. Trade me now, so you get value out of me." 
now that he was basically just like, yeah, I had no idea this was happening. This makes kind of less sense to me why Florida would do this. I mean, listen, like the the player they got back is phenomenal. I'm not here to say that. I'm not say I'm not here to say that you know that that he isn't. But Matthew I thought Kachuk like oh, I thought yeah like yeah 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 I'm talking about Kachuk. But like you know the I I thought okay well they knew they weren't gonna keep Huberto. Huberto didn't want to stay, so they had to get the best value that they could. So they so they went and they swung for for Kachuk from Calgary and they got him. Now that Huberto was like, I had no idea this was gonna happen, and like I was so surprised at all this. I'm like, I'm thinking about this. Like, why, why, why did, why did, why, why? What? This, this. Now this makes a whole lot less sense of Florida, but that's that's beside the point. So yeah, that just purely, you gotta be available. You don't know what's out there, and it's one of the things I, I know a lot of Ranger fans have talked about, especially during the lean years when they were rebuilding. Was the Rangers should be weaponizing their cap space? They should be taking bad contracts to get draft picks. I mean, the Coyotes are going to, I think, have another draft with more than I think. I think they have eleven in the twenty twenty three draft next year, and just keep rolling it over. If you are a team that is awful like the Coyotes, just keep rolling it over. Keep turning those having those picks but eventually at some point you're gonna have to have those picks either turn into good players or trade the players you drafted to go get good players to andrew's point that that's really the thing here you can't get too strung up on any one thing overall if you take anything away from this exercise and i'll i'll put the spreadsheet somewhere so people can look at it if they're curious you have to have flexibility. You can, if a good player becomes a restricted free agent and like Matthew Kachuk and says, I don't want to stay here. Well, the Rangers were shit out of luck. They, they didn't have the cap space to take on $8 million. Even if they had all the assets to go out and get a Kachuk, which they knew that they would have had to give up a lot to get him. But the Rangers had more than enough guys to say, okay, we'll send you three guys, a first round pick, a second round pick, go ahead. And we'll take Matthew Kachuk. You got to have the cap space to do it. And, don't just spend cap space because you have it. Vegas had the greatest advantage of any team coming into the league where their roster that first year, they only had, I think, $65 million committed to it. Uh, Seattle is somewhere in that ballpark where they're just right above the floor of, I think the floor was $65 million last year, something like that. It doesn't matter what the number is, but sit around and wait. The, for example, Seattle got Oliver Bjorkstrand, who is a good player, a legitimately good top six player, for nothing, for a second and third round pick, they yep. got a top six forward who's going to give them 60 to 70 points. You can always get somebody if you have cap space. That That's the thing I want to emphasize here before we do parting shots. Cap space is great to have. Prospects, draft picks, all great, all great. And it, there is no point in just saying we need to focus on this, we need to focus on that. Now, there are some teams who are kind of forced into certain boxes. I mentioned before Winnipeg. Winnipeg is in that situation. A lot of the teams in Canada, I would say, aside from the Leafs and Montreal, are kind of in that boat where people don't necessarily want to go play there because the tax rate is different. If they're American, it's a little bit more complicated seeing their family consistently. So there are reasons why certain teams have to be, okay, we can only really draft guys, or if we're going to go into free agency, we really have to overspend to entice people to come here. So that's a little bit different. But for most franchises... If you have cap space, you have assets, you can go out and get a lot of interesting talent. That 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 would be my last point there. Don't be afraid to go see what's out there because you'd be surprised. Uh, Matthew Kachuk was out there for all of a week, and it didn't seem like anybody other than Florida made a good offer. Like I, I was reading what the Blues were offering. Vladimir Tarasenko is not a headlining return for the Calgary Flames. Like Tarasenko had a nice bounce back season last year, but he's not good enough to trade a top five left wing in the entire sport for. I like Tarasenko a lot. Um, I do think if they, if the St. Louis Blues really wanted Matthew Kachuk, they could have made it happen. It would have been Cairo. I, yeah, they, they would have had to give up a piece that they ultimately didn't want to give up, whether it be Jordan Cairo. I don't know. I mean, uh, maybe Robert Thomas would have been too much for St. Louis, but they, they would have had to give it up a piece that they really wanted to hold on to. And ultimately, that's what they did. Instead of trading for Matthew Kachuk, they overpaid Nick Letty a lot more money than, than he should have he, he should be making and decided to, to stay with the rush that they have. And that's if Doug Armstrong decides that that is the, the best decision, then I guess 
uh, I guess we'll wait and see. I mean, I, Matthew Kachuk, I think, would have been a phenomenal fit in St. Louis, but he didn't want to part with some of the names that probably would have went the other way if that trade were to go down. And whether you agree with that or not, I guess we'll, like I said, we'll, we'll wait and see what happens. But ultimately, you have to do what you think is the best for your team, whether it be in a trade or in a free agent signing or, you know, in the draft. But like, I don't think the avenue matters as much. What, Matt, what, what the most important thing about this is, is, is my team good now? And what do I have to do to make it better? If we're a cup contending team, what do I have to do? If we're in between, what do I have to do? And if we're atrocious, what do I have to do? Because there's th there's different ways of going about it in each different scenario, but focusing more on one as opposed to another, I guess if you're really bad, then you focus more on the drafts unless you know, you're know you you're selling and you really just want to, to get as much value as you can back. But even then, like let's say you know, you're know the Coyotes and you have a fire sale, you have, I don't know, let's let's make a number. Let's, let's say you have 16 picks in the draft. Okay, then you trade four of them let's let's you know for example you you trade like a first round like a, a a mid first round pick that you got from somebody else and like two second round picks that you got from somebody else and you move up to i don't know the top 10 or the top 12 or whatever like you can do that and instead of trade instead of drafting 16 players that you know most of them probably won't play for you that you you have five but those out of those five three or four have a really good chance of being good prospects. And a couple of years down the line, if you're potentially knocking on the playoff door and you're buying, okay, then of those five guys, let's trade two of them and a future pick for a guy that can help us right now. Like that should be the way that GMs build their teams. And unfortunately, like there are a few, there are a few teams that do that kind of thing, but I feel like a lot of GMs just, put too much stock in this this is our guy we're gonna hold on to him he's he's a, a part of our future yeah but eventually that's not gonna be the case for everybody man like you gotta make the trade at some point one thing before we go to parting shots because you mentioned it and i you i forgot about it while i was talking so most teams you have seven rounds in a draft you have seven picks coming into a year if you get two guys who are nhlers not even good nhlers just two 300 nhl games that's a good draft class just purely on a value level you need to be getting two to three nhl players i'm not saying stars guys who are capable of playing at the nhl level from every draft class if you want to keep a reasonably stocked roster they don't need to be amazing but they need to be able to play at the nhl level over a certain period by a certain point usually most people start getting given most people start giving up on guys 23 24 is when it starts to become okay this guy isn't anything like julian gautier for example is 20 i think 24 years old now and more or less we realize he's a tweener he's going to be on someone's nhl roster he's never really going to be more than you know a fourth line wing there's a market out there for him it's probably a fifth or sixth round pick but if he is on your fourth line he will not make your team worse those are the type of people that's the thing. And he will get another chance from someone else because he was a first round pick. That's the last thing I have on that. Andrew, I went first last week. The floor is yours, sir. So my parting shot for this week is don't play scared. And that is more so for the GMs building the team than the players on the ice. Like if you are, let's say you're Joe Sackick, who is no longer the GM now as the president of operations for the, for the Avalanche, we'll say Joe Sackick for the sake of he built the team that the Avalanche used to win the cup. So let's say you're Joe Sackick. Instead of trading for all these guys that helped you win the cup, you decide, I, I value these draft picks and I value these prospects more than anything, and I'd rather play it slow and have a slow simmer than hit the and hit a home run and, and win the cup and go all for, you know, all in to win the cup. If that happened, the Avalanche do not win the Stanley Cup. And I think that's very important to remember and, and categorize when you have a, a specific roster and you feel like you can go all the way. You cannot play scared. Sometimes it doesn't work out. You don't you don't bat a thousand with these things as 
Florida will tell you, Florida dra- traded for Claude Giroux, and they did all these things, and they were, you know, they signed Bobrovsky to a lifetime deal. Like, they, they did these things, and it didn't work out. I'm not saying that this is a guaranteed strategy that will win you the cup every time. That's not, that's not the case. But, like, if you play scared, if you, let's say, have a roster right now that is second in your division or, you know, who that you think could be a solid team, not just for this season but beyond, and you don't make the right moves to make them better now, you are playing scared. And you cannot do that when you're a general manager in the NHL. I understand that the longer the team makes the playoffs, the safer your job is. But isn't the goal to win a Stanley Cup? I understand that it's riskier to make trades, and sometimes you get fleeced because it's the trade deadline, and you give up more than you might want to. And, you know, like these things happen, of course, but you can't play scared when when it comes to these things. Joe Sackick didn't play scared. He went out, got Lekkinen and and all these guys, and he really filled out the roster. What did they do? They were the best team out there, and they won the Stanley Cup. What a shocker. If you're a general manager, you cannot play scared or else you will never win the Stanley Cup. Definitely. Okay. Mine is very simple. Um, there's no more hiding the kids. Uh, the Ra- Like I said before, when we were talking about the roster construction, the Rangers do not have any other options right now. Right now, when you look at their depth chart, their first line right wing is Capo Caco and a bunch of guys. There's Vitaly Kravtsov in there, who we assume is going to be on the team. And then they're going to figure out the other two right wings because it doesn't seem obvious. I, one of them is probably going to be Mac, uh, Mac Carpenter. I'm thinking of the Yankees, Ryan Carpenter or Ryan <laughs> Reeves. And then the third line right wing, I, I, it, your yeah. guess is as good as mine. Most people are assuming that one of Chris Kreider or Alexi Lafreniere is going to play on their opposite side to resolve this imbalance because the Rangers have Sammy Blay coming back with the idea that he would be the third line right wing. And then one of Kreider and Orloff will move to the right. And that would fill out the rest of the lineup. I don't want to see Ryan Carpenter in the top six. I don't want to see Dryden Hunt in the top six sink or swim. You drafted all of these guys. You have sold a bill of goods that we were bad for four straight years with the idea that some of these guys would be valuable. Keandre Miller looks like he's going to be a guy. Other than him, Loff, Kako, Heedle, I got to see it. And this is it. There are, there's no magic box like there was last year. There's no $10 million in cap space accumulating every single day. There, there isn't going to be the Frank Vetrano, Andrew Kopp, Justin Braun, there's not going to be four or five moves at the deadline. If the Rangers are going to be aggressive, which I assume they will, because like you just said, they're not going to play scared. One move, maybe two. Maybe you go get an extra defenseman just in case because you always have to have that seventh D just in case for the playoffs. One good move. This is it for Heedle. This is probably it for Heedle, like we talked about a few weeks ago. Based on the way the money is laid out, based on his production, this is probably it. If they get a great year out of him, they'll flip him into something else. If he's not, maybe they can afford to keep him if he underperforms. I know you mentioned before you kind of hope he has a mediocre year next year for that reason. There's no more hiding it. There's no more, well, we got to protect these guys. We got to give them favorable matchup. All of them have at least three years. This will be Loft's third NHL season. This will be Kako's fourth. This will be Hedl's fifth. There's no more they're inexperienced. There's no more we need to protect them matchups-wise. You drafted these guys as high as you did. It's time for the, you, the Rangers organization, to do something with them. Yeah. That'll just about do it. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, yeah, well, yeah really quickly. I mean, like, in terms of Hedo, like, I obviously hope that he scores 1,000 points on which the Rangers winning the Cup. Like, I'm not I'm not here out here saying, like, oh, yeah, I hope Hedo scores, like, 20 points uh, so that the Rangers can resign. Like, that's... Last dance, Andrew. Win yeah. the Cup and Hedo yeah, yeah. can leave. Last dance. Yeah, exactly, the exactly. Hedo last like, dance. The idea of not playing scared is that, like, if Chris Drury sees that there's a trade at the deadline that includes, let's say, Philip Hedo, if you trade Hedo for... Uh, uh, whoever, like insert name here, a top, a, a Patrice Rabola Bergeron, because the Bruins sure. are going to be out of a playoff spot. Sure, sure. If you have to include Philip Hedo in a trade to get Patrice Bergeron, you do it. You do yes. it. And yes, I agreed. don't care how many points Philip Hedo is scoring. I understand that Patrice Bergeron is 36, I think he's 36 old. Like, he 
is a player that is getting up there in age. I understand that. At the same time, though, he's still phenomenal at hockey. Yes, Filipino is going to have a longer career post-2022 than Patrice Bergeron is. But if the, if the Boston Bruins are going to trade Patrice Bergeron and you aren't going to trade for him because you want to hold on to Filipino and he is the same Filipino that we saw over the course of the last regular season, I can't help you. Like, Filipino's Andrew, ceiling. I have, I have a perfect re- thing to explain yeah. the exact thing you're talking about. I forget who it was who tweeted it. It might have even been me. During the course of the season, Sam Stern started that, would you trade um, Lindgren for Chikrin? He started that. And then a few weeks later, I tweeted, I think it was me who tweeted, would you trade Ryan Lindgren for Charlie McAvoy? And I still had 20 to 30% of people saying no. Charlie McAvoy, no. who's one of the five best defensemen in the entire league. There's a, there's not, you're never going to win with everybody. Like we talked yeah. about in the first segment, you're never going to be able to get everybody to understand, to agree with you. Yeah, it's it's silly. Like you have yeah. to do what you what it what it takes to make your team better. If you have to trade Ly- Ryan Lingren to get Charlie McAvoy, let me tell you something. You trade. I'll Ryan drive him Lindgren. myself. I'll drive him myself. Yeah. You you trade Ryan Lingren. Like I love Ryan Lingren. I think what he does is great. I I like him as a Ranger. I think he's very good at what he does. He's a perfect partner for 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 Adam Fox. Adam Fox can be more aggressive on the offense because Ryan Lingren will do none of that ever he will stay on the blue line and he will never pinch he will never go after the puck like that's his that's his style he's a stay at home defenseman and he does that very well they're they're a great pair if you move let's let's a hypothetical if you have to trade Ryan Lindgren and two first round picks to 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 get Charlie McAvoy you get Charlie McAvoy like i it, this it it just it's so surprising to me that some people are like oh well but but Ryan Lindgren he's a, he's a great ranger yeah you know who's going to be a better Ranger? It's Charlie McAvoy. Like, it's, it's, I'm losing my mind here. Like, some people refuse okay. to believe that. And, and it, it, it drives me insane Ooh, that some people can't understand that. Like, you can trade a really good player and other assets to get a better player. Like, it's, <laughs> this is, this is insanity to some people that think that, that you don't have to do that. Yeah, you do. If you want to win the Stanley Cup, you got to do that. You gotta, like, dude, some people, I I can't understand their thought process when it comes to these things. Like you have to do, you can't play scared, man. You can't. I understand that you like Ryan Lindgren. I understand that. But you know who you're really going to like? It's Charlie McAvoy. Go do the trade. It's a hypothetical. It's not going to happen. But like insert names here for better insert names here. You have to do that if you really want a shot at a Stanley Cup. You sound like a used car salesman. You just banged on the hood and said he's ready to drive off the lot right now if you'll take him. <laughs> I, you it inspired, just fires me you, up, man. You inspired an idea for next week that I wrote down, so that that I can use for later. That that's very good. Okay, he's got he's got Let's, the post-it notes. Like I wait, like we mentioned earlier, he's the Nick Zadaris is the reason the post-it note economy is still alive because he's the he's the only one buying the post-it notes. So he's he's keeping that he's keeping that boat afloat. So you remember how we talked about I started a new book? I also have the tabs that you put in books to keep specific things, like the little oh, thin boy. post-it notes. So yeah, I am I, I am single-handedly yeah. keeping the post-it Nick, notes. Nick Zararis is your 11th grade AP English teacher. That, that's what we've yes. all come to understand, is Nick Zararis is, is going to walk into your English class one day and just teach. That's what he's doing. Uh, there, there's an alternate universe where I probably am teaching high school English right now. So, I, well, let's let's put a pin in that and save that for the last week of August when we're very, very much out of content. <laughs> um, you can follow the show on pretty much all the major social media platforms on Twitter, Instagram, at Twitter and Instagram. We're Liberty Blue Pod on it's Twitch dash Liberty Blue Pod on YouTube. You can see it at the bottom of the screen in the video right here. It's YouTube slash Liberty Blue Podcast in full. The full video of this episode will be there. I think the live stream automatically saves, so that'll be there. And then I'll tweak it, add the vi- I'll add a thumbnail, make it look pretty, all that. That'll be on YouTube. Andrew's going to get to work on the audio as soon as we're done. It'll be up on Apple, Spotify, uh, Stitcher, and all the other major podcasting platforms. Um, you can follow Andrew at Chelney Andrew, C-H-E-L-N-E-Y Andrew. You can follow me at Nick Zararis, Nick, Z-A-R-A-R-I-S. 
Um, we'll be back next week. I have one last big picture hockey thing we can talk about. And then we're really going to start getting into the, maybe we're going to have to play a drinking game on air or something. <laughs> <laughs> we might. I mean, listen, that's, that's an idea. I do not work on Tuesdays. So that's oh, okay. Maybe that might have to be a content idea type deal. <laughs> oh wait, no, I forgot. I'm going on vacation next week. We're going to have to get Ooh. creative on Monday. Ooh. We're going right. to have to get creative on Monday. I'm going to be North right. of the border next week. Oh, wow. We're going to get, okay. yeah. Yeah, I, I'm gonna go. See some Instagram posts by you, Nick. Is that is it finally gonna be the the, the day that yes, we have the, the Instagram post? Yes, you're you're gonna see me in a Chris Kreider jersey taking a picture with the Gila Fleur statue in front of the Bell Center. <laughs> <sighs> well, uh, ho hopefully, Emily isn't there to trip you up. <laughs> all right, we'll see you guys next week. Uh, be safe, Later. all that. Later.